Hi, welcome to Board Gems, my regular video series in which I cover older board game gems. Share the love with you, that's what I want to do. Some of these old games are great. And this game that I'm covering this time has a pedigree. I tell you, it's designed by Stefan Dora, who is one of the patron saints of this video series. Uh, a lot of the games that he designs, simple rules, high interaction, mwah, chef's kiss. And published by my favorite board game publisher, Hansem Gluck. It's a bit of an older game, come out originally 2001. It's called Medina. So this is the English printing from uh, Rio Grande games. Like I said, it originally came out in 2001. It is for three or four players, this edition. Uh, that range specifically. No more, no fewer. And ages 10 and up, I think that's quite fair. And box is about an hour. Again, probably pretty fair. It was a while uh, after that, 2014, that we finally saw the second edition from, I believe the original publisher was White Goblin out of the Netherlands. Here's the second edition. And again, this is the English printing, this time from Stronghold. Uh, they've added rules for two players. Very special, very unique game, Medina. Um, there's only just the random state at the beginning of the game, which is in fact, not very random. It's like in the original edition, it's just where you place a single pawn just on one starting space somewhere on the board. And then after that, it's all up to the players. No randomness, no card draws or plays, of, of course. Uh, no, certainly no dice rolls. Everybody has a bunch of wooden pieces behind their screen and on their turn, they have to play too. And some of them will uh, grow palace sizes and you try to claim them with your wooden rooftop. There's a snake of merchants that go through the, the streets in between the palaces. And if you can be adjacent to them, you score points. You can extend your palaces with stables. You can build walls coming out of the, the corners of the, uh, of the city, of the board. And if your palace is next to, uh, to a wall, you'll get points. And the last player to connect to a corner, to a tower via a wall, will get bonus points. The, the largest palace of every color will score points. It's all about choosing what to do, which pieces of yours to put on the board. And it's several games of chicken all going on at the same time. Let me show you how it plays, and then I will tell you more about why it's a gem. To set up the game, place the board on the table between the players. You want to place the tiles on the board. These are the tower tiles. Each one has a number on it. You're going to put it next to the correct corner of the board, matching the number. These are palace tiles. You can put these up here. If you have second edition and you also have these, which are tea tiles, decide at the beginning of the game if you want to use them. If you do, you'll put all six of them in a stack just on the side here. You have these wooden towers. You're gonna to place one on every corner of the board. Second edition has a well. Place that on any space on the board, but make sure it's away from the wall. But anywhere will do. An optional rule, which is a standard rule in second edition, is to place extra merchants on the tower tiles themselves. Each tower tile gets a number of merchants such that the total of the number and the total of the merchants is four. So for the one tower tile, you would add three merchants. For the three tower tile, you would add one. The two tower tile, you would add two. And the four tower tile, you wouldn't add any. That's an optional rule. You cannot do that with first edition. There aren't enough of these merchants. And as well, there are a pile of merchants. That's these tiny little pawns here. You're going to place that on a random space on the board. Again, not next to the edge, just somewhere. Each player gets a shield and they get four domes of their color. There are a lot of wooden pieces in this game and you're going to divide them amongst all the players. But each player will get a certain number of palace pieces in the four colors, a number of wall pieces, a number of stables, and a number of merchant pawns. 
and the players put these wooden pieces behind their screen. If you're playing a three player game, you're going to have domes of a particular color left over, which will be the fourth player's pieces. And actually each player is going to get, I think, one of these. Choose a start player. The start player and the next player clockwise, the second player, they will start the game with one action. And then starting with the third player on, each player will have two actions on their turn. And an action usually consists of taking one of their wooden pieces and putting it somewhere on the board. Generally speaking, you always have to do that. If you have two actions, you have to put two wooden pieces on the board. They can be the same type of piece, different pieces, doesn't matter. These are palace pieces. By the end of the game, each player can claim one palace of every color. There are four colors of palaces. The first brown palace piece, for example, can go anywhere, including next to the edge. The only catch is that the eight spaces around the well cannot have any sort of building on them. But otherwise, you can place the wooden piece anywhere but as long as there is, for example, one brown palace piece, in the future, if anybody wants to place a brown palace piece, it has to be adjacent. And by adjacent, I mean orthogonal, diagonal doesn't count. In fact, none of the palaces can be diagonal from one another. So this is a palace of size two. This is a palace of size three. One of the wooden pieces that you can place on your turn is a dome and you use domes to claim palaces you have one dome for every color of palace if it is blue's turn blue could for example as their first action place a brown palace piece and for their second action take one of their domes and put it on top they have now claimed this palace and you can no longer add any palace pieces of that color to the palace once it's been claimed Blue has claimed this brown palace. Blue cannot later on claim another brown palace. Blue now has three domes left over for the remaining three colors. Because a palace, once it's been claimed, cannot grow with more palace pieces, in the future, if you want to put down a brown palace piece, you can now place it anywhere, thereby starting a second brown palace. And later, brown palace pieces will have to be adjacent to that until somebody claims it, or unless it can't grow anymore. And that's possible because palaces must always keep two spaces apart from each other. Let's say it looks something like this. The only place you can place a brown palace piece is in this space. After that, regardless of whether it's claimed or not, you cannot add any more palace pieces to this palace because that would break the rules of being adjacent to two other palaces. So at that point, again, you can start a new brown palace somewhere else. And later on, again, a player may choose to claim any palace on the board by choosing to place their dome piece. But again, each player can only have one palace of each of the four colors. And palaces are the way you score points in this game. At the end of the game, each palace is worth a number of points equal to its size. So this palace is worth four. This palace, if it's claimed, is worth two. But there's more ways that the palace can score points. The first player to build a brown palace would take this tile. Whoever has this tile at the end of the game will score three points. It goes to the player who built the largest palace of that color. So you see the four colors of palaces are worth different numbers of points. If later on somebody builds a larger palace, they would take that tile from them. And at the end of the game, whoever has this tile gets three points. The other ways of scoring points involve the well, and the walls, and the towers, and the merchants, and the stables. But these all, again, have to do with the four palaces. As one of your actions, you can place a stable. You can place a stable next to any palace. But you can't connect palaces, so this would not be allowed. You could not add a stable to this palace, because there's no room for it. Unlike the palace pieces, stables can be placed on palaces that have already been claimed. So that's actually a way that you can grow your palace, even after you've already claimed it. 
and this counts toward the size as well. So right now, this palace is worth 5 points. Generally, you'll want to place stables next to your own palaces, but you can place them anywhere, next to any palaces. A palace will score an additional 4 points if any part of it occupies these 4 spaces, one of these 4 spaces around the well. If a palace claims one of these spaces, it will gain a bonus 4 points. You can also place a merchant. A merchant always has to be placed next to one other merchant, if possible, and cannot be placed next to two. Generally, there will be a snake of merchants that will be placed around the board. So you could not put a merchant here, because that's next to two. The only valid places are here, or here, or here, or here. At the end of the game, every merchant that's next to a palace of yours will score you one point. So right now, this palace is worth four points plus two for these merchants. So when you place a merchant, you can place it on either end and you can choose the direction. So from here, you could choose to put it here or here or here and thereby directing the flow of the merchants. But it is certainly possible to reach a dead end. You can't see that, but anyway, the merchant is there. Once one end reaches a dead end, if you want to place a merchant, it has to be on the other end. And only when both ends have reached the end, <laughs> their dead ends, and they can't grow anymore on their ends, only at that point can you then place a merchant anywhere you like on the board and thereby growing a new line of merchants. Every merchant that's next to your palace is worth one point. That also counts for stables. If there's a stable here and a merchant gets placed here, and again, that is going to score one point. Three points plus five for the palace. The stable is an extension of the palace. Walls are always placed next to towers or next to other walls. So in that sense, each tower may have up to two walls coming out from them. So there might be two walls, two sets of walls, on the same side of the board, but they can never meet. There must always be one space in between the two sets of walls. That's considered the, the entryway, the gate into the city. So what do walls do? Well, like merchants, walls will score one point for palaces that are adjacent to them. So right now, this orange palace is worth six points. Two for the palace pieces themselves, two for the adjacent merchants, and two for the adjacent walls. If you have a stable next to a wall, that's an extension of the palace and will also add one point for the stable itself and also for the wall adjacent to it. Something else happens with walls. The owner of the palace that first connects to a tower via a wall claims the tower tile next to it. If this palace was owned by Green, somebody put a wall here, immediately Green would get the tower tile. And at the end of the game, this is worth four points. In this edition, there may also be merchants on the tile, and the first player to connect to that tower would get those merchants. And hang on to this tile for now. But this tile always goes to the player who owns the last palace to connect to the tower. So while green has this tower tile for now, if later on more walls are built, now this red palace connects. Now red would take this tile from them. The palace doesn't have to be bigger, that only matters for these. It's always the last player to connect via walls to a tower. And you'll see the four towers are worth different numbers of points. Once a palace claims a tower tile, they can never get it back. So right now, red has this tile. If later on, green puts walls here, doesn't matter. Green already had the tower tile and can't take it back with the same palace. Of course, if green owned another palace here and was able to connect a new palace of theirs to the tower, then they would get the tile 
from red. It's always the last palace connecting to the tower. Even if you're able to take this tile away from another player, if there were merchants on this tile, you don't get those. It's only the first player to claim a tile gets those merchants. And the last thing to go over are the tea tiles, if you choose to play with them. First edition doesn't have them. Second edition does, but they're optional. You can choose to play them or not. I think the standard rules say to include them. There are six. You'll notice they're the same color as the purple palace tile. That's because the first player to claim a purple palace will get three tea tiles. The next player to claim a purple palace would get two, and the third player to claim a purple palace would get one. The fourth player, if there is a fourth player playing, would not get any. You can play tea tiles instead of wooden pieces. So normally you have to put down two wooden pieces on your turn. Instead, you could put down one and a tea tile. The tea tile just goes out of the game. But you always have to play at least one wooden piece. Even if you have two tea tiles, you couldn't play them both on the same turn. But you could play one, so you only have to put down one wooden piece instead of two. Once all players have claimed a palace of a certain color, any more pieces they have of that color go away. If some players still have some behind their screen, they just put them out of the game. But players keep playing with all the wooden pieces they have. More domes, maybe more palace pieces, stables, merchants, and walls. The game ends when all wooden pieces that can be played have been played. It is possible, for example, that a player may have stables left, but there's no place to put them, at which point they don't have to play them. They can't play them. And then you total up the scores. For each palace, you figure out how many points it's worth. It's one point for every palace piece, plus one for every connected stable, plus one for every merchant adjacent to it, plus one for every wall adjacent to it, and plus four if it happens to be exactly two spaces away in a straight line from the well. And then add to that any palace tiles or tower tiles you have. And the player with the most points wins. That's it, you're ready to play Medina. Medina is a very special game. For one thing, it has no luck during the game. There's no dice rolls, there's no card plays. Everything in the game is controlled by the players. However, of course, you're playing typically a three or four player game. There's still gonna be a lot of chaos in terms of what the other players do, but you can kind of predict that a little bit. Not fully, but a bit. You can always see what pieces are in play on the board, and so you know what is still to come. And a huge part of this game is positioning yourself so that you benefit no matter what comes later. Like if you know that a certain number of pieces, there's still a lot yet to be played, you know that and then you can play around that possibility because in the end, pretty much all the pieces or almost all the pieces are going to be played. So if you see, oh, there's not a lot of merchants on the board yet, well, plan for a big long merchant line to come later and you can try to navigate that. Plan around the pieces that are to come. We all start with the same initial state and everything is being played technically from a shield. A lot of times in that situation, there'll be a lot of people who say like, well, you don't need to hide it then. Why hide it? Why even bother having the shields? You could play without the shields and have all the information completely visible to all players. It still totally works. You want to keep an eye on what pieces are yet to come and that is trackable information. You can even look at the board state and know, okay, I know, you know, these number of pieces are still to come. What you're not going to remember if you use shields is who has what. It's trackable information, but in practice, when you play the game, you don't necessarily remember who played what. So you know there's five more purple palace pieces, flying purple palace pieces, 
yet to be played, but you're not going to remember that Joan has three of them, right? That's where the, the hidden part comes in, and it does help the game in that, in that case. You can totally play it without the shields, have everything open, and then it's a really can be a really thinky experience. It's still a thinky experience, no doubt. Using the player shields just takes the edge off that perfect information. And you still have a lot of information, but you just don't you you are unable to predict the the order of things uh, so easily. So I, I always play with the shields, always. So you might think, okay, random start, right? In the original edition, it's just where that first pawn, the merchant pawn, is placed. In the second edition, there's also the, the fountain. After that, it's all controlled by the players. Well, wouldn't every game feel very samey? I don't find so. For one thing, the early game, and this is potentially a, a shortcoming, not a flaw, not a flaw in the game. It's not an objective problem with the game, but it's something going in you have to be aware of is that the first part of the game can feel a little directionless. So those initial moves are not random, but they might as well be. A big thing is just feeling out the other players, right? Okay, if I'm going to grow this gray palace, you know, is somebody, when is somebody going to jump on it? If it still comes back around to me, then maybe I'll jump on it. But let's see what the other players do. Those initial moves kind of testing the waters a little bit also effectively act like a randomizer because people are going to try different things in different games. Oh, we're going to try to grow this palace over here this time, maybe a little bit closer to the edge, that sort of thing. So actually each game in the end develops quite differently, but you do have that beginning part of the game in which it does feel a little bit like, I, I don't know what I'm doing yet. <laughs> I'm going to play a bit. And then by mid game, of course, then you're like, oh, OK, now I've got a plan, right? I see this person has a orange uh, four sized palace. And I'm going to see if I can. And, you know, there's still orange palaces to come. And there's a big open area in the corner of the board. So I'm going to see if I can get another big palace, orange palace, take that uh, palace tile away from them. By mid game, you start those goals start to develop, right? And it's the same for all players, of course. So again, you have the interaction. Interaction is very important in a game. And it's something that I've complained about endlessly on this channel, about how a lot of newer, more modern games have less player interaction. People aren't butting heads as much. And that can be a good thing and it can be a bad thing. Now, in the case of Medina, it is possible for one or even two players to start falling way behind. It's possible for two players to be close in each other uh, to a lead, and then a third player plays something and elevates one player over the other. Now that's king making. That's a bad thing, right? Objectively, king making is a bad thing. Sometimes I think designers at least newer designers um, are taking away some of the the wrong lessons from some of these uh, design philosophies or kind of design truths that propagate through through the hobby. It is widely considered that king making is bad, and I would agree with that. But you have to look at it in the context of how the game is being played, how this particular game is being played. But a big part of this game is playing for the future, knowing that other players are going to have to put down these pieces. There's an X number of stables in the game, and they're probably all going to come out. So as a player, you can plan for that. And the winner of Medina is going to be the player who is best able to benefit from other players' piece placements. So if I king make in this game and you and another player were close and my play ended up helping them instead of you, don't take it personally. I have to play it somewhere. Maybe, just maybe, that player was the, that I ended up helping played the game in such a way that 
made it more likely for that to happen to them, and therefore they deserve the win. That's a big part of the game. When you know that all or almost all of the pieces are going to be out, you can plan for that. I love the pulling back and forth of objectives that sometimes they conflict with each other. So on the one hand, you want to have the largest palace of a certain color. And some palaces are worth more than others in terms of their, their color. So you, know, you would love to have the most valuable orange palace, say. I think that's the most valuable one, the orange palace. So you want the biggest orange palace. So somebody builds an orange palace size four. You can try to build a five, but of course you're also playing with other players. Maybe you build it up three, four, somebody else claims it. Okay, then you kind of start to build another one. And in the end, maybe there isn't enough room on the board to even fit a five size palace. So that player ended up making the right move, claiming the four. They could have kind of planned, they could have hoped to build a five, but there's that that rush, right? Like you want to be, you want to have the biggest, but you also want to be the first to build the biggest. So if you think nobody's gonna be able to build a size five, then you wanna be the first to build a size four. There's different strategies for the different pieces. You have the merchant pawns and the way those snake around the board. You have some control, but not fully. There's gonna be a push and pull. Right? Some players, sometimes you and another player can work together to bring the merchants uh, between your two palaces. So you're benefiting, but also they are. A little bit of shared incentive there. You claim the tower tiles if you are the first to connect to the tower. But anybody, regardless of whether their palace is bigger or not, anybody who connects to the tower after you takes the tile from you. And you can't take it back, at least with the same palace. You know, there, there's a little bit of a game of chicken there, right? You want the other players to have to commit their walls to build up to their palaces. So they claim the tower tile, but then you still have enough tower tiles, um, wall tiles rather, left, wall pieces, to connect to that tower after them. But maybe there's a palace right next to yours and they can just extend that wall past your palace and then they take the, the token. The pull of the different things that can can score you points right stables are amazing and you can place a stable onto your palace after you've already claimed the palace so something you can't do with actual palace pieces so it's tempting to save the stables until later but players who play their stables earlier can like if they're in neighboring palaces and they stick out a uh, stable you know, kind of toward you, then you won't be able to build a stable in that direction, right? <laughs> oh, there's lots of wonderful things going on. Because there is no real scoring until the end, I mean, you can kind of see what the score will be while you play, but you don't total anything up really until the end. You can feel like you don't get very much feedback. Like if I'm, there's a gray palace on the board, I want to make it one piece bigger. Is that a good move or a bad move? I put one piece down. Now another player claims it. Maybe I should have claimed it. Was that a bad move? I can't tell until the end of the game, or at least you know midway, two thirds of the way through the game, when you start to see how the board is going to end up. Right? And then you sort of go, "Oh, maybe I shouldn't have done that." So that's a, a bit of an obstacle, possibly for new players coming in. They're they're not going to be able to see how their early moves affect the game later. I will say the game also is absolutely beautiful. I, I suppose depending on your choice of aesthetics, because nowadays what's considered a beautiful game is a game with really saturated, detailed, colorful artwork. And this is a much more classy presentation. It has just bare art. The board kind of shows just a desert. No. But once the game is built out, uh, you know, it's gorgeous looking to see all the wooden pieces all and you see this kind of organically built city building up over the course of the game. And at the end of the game, you want to take a photo because, you know, you just built this thing out of wood together <laughs> and it just it just looks great. It looks classy. I do think that there are game designs that are sort of ideal from a game designer's point of view. 
like the type of game design in which another game designer would look at that and go, that's amazing. I have so much respect for Stefan Dora, the designer of this game, for making Medina. One of the things I think that really impresses game designers is when you can have a game that basically has no luck, no randomness, and it's all different point values of things, different objectives, shared objectives that the other players have. Maybe sometimes they're working together, sometimes they're working against each other. And with that set of rules, even though there's no luck, no randomness, every game can play differently, end up playing differently. Maybe it just has a little bit of randomization at the, at the beginning, like where you put that merchant pawn. But the game develops completely differently, just based on the player decisions. That's fascinating. Stefan Dora is probably one of my favorite game designers. Um, and he really has a, a talent for this. And Medina is one of his best games, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, Marrakesh, which I've also covered, is a, is a really good one of his as well. The game is available on Board Game Arena. Um, I think it's a premium game, so that means that you can join other people's games, but you can't create one on your own unless you're a paying member. And it's great played asynchronously, so play your turn, come back the next day, play your turn then, because each move, like on your turn, you're going to do two actions, and you can think it through, right? You can look at the board state, and you can, you know, you can puzzle it out as long as you want, right? Okay, well, I think, you know, I'll go here, and then if I do that, then they'll, somebody will probably do that, right? It really benefits from, from async play. That's a really great way to play it. So if you have a chance, give it a try on Board Game Arena before, you know, finding a copy. Both of these are kind of hard to find now. Uh, this one would be easier. This is second edition. I should talk about the differences between the two. So this one came out long time ago, 2001, from Hans M. Gluck, English edition from Rio Grande Games. And here we have second edition, which was uh, 2014, I think. And that was... Originally, the original publisher, I believe, was White Goblin. Uh, this English edition is from, from Stronghold. Both editions will do you, honestly. Um, the boxes are exactly the same size. You can probably see this one's a little more colorful, a little more evocative. Pieces are slightly bigger in this edition. Uh, there are a few variants that have been added. The most notable change is they added um, an extra piece called the Well which starts on the board at the start of the game. And any palace, which is exactly sort of two spaces away from it, like there's four spaces around the well, and any palace that is covering one of those four spaces gets a bonus four points. In general, I like that. Um, for one thing, it gives a little bit of push to some players to claim palaces early. When the board is very wide open, it's common for players to just wait, wait, wait on building palaces. And this one, there's a little bit of an incentive at the beginning. Generally speaking, palaces are more valuable close to the walls instead of the middle of the board. So if you have the wall kind of close to the middle, it kind of balances that out a bit. And it's another randomizer, right? For the start of the game, you know, you're gonna start with the merchant pawn in one space, you're gonna start with a well in a different space. And that's just another way to kind of just randomize that, that setup initially. So I like it. I ended up adding a small uh, blue glass stone to my old edition so I can play it that way too. It's a nice change. The other interesting change is that the tower tiles, so they're worth one, two, three, and four points, but they also have extra merchant pawns on them. The one point tile has three merchants, the two point has two, the three point has one, and the four point has none. And for one thing, it makes the low point towers more valuable because you're getting merchants to play. But also, it encourages a player to connect to the tower first, right? There's alternate um, benefits to going early versus going later. If you claim the tower tile first, yeah, it's more likely, I guess, suppose, that somebody will take the tile away from you later if they're able to connect to that same tower. But those merchants are yours to keep. And one interesting thing that does is it varies up the number of pieces everyone has, which is kind of interesting. Um, I'm, I don't need it in my game. 
it is a neat extra thing and it's nice to be able to play with it and unfortunately there aren't enough merchants in the first edition to be able to try that variant um so it's, i guess another advantage of the second edition one addition uh to second edition that i did not like are the tea tiles these are tiles that you can get uh, whenever you build a purple palace purple is the two point palace why purple why not you can spend one to kind of pass one of your two actions. I understand what they're trying to do. Uh, with the tea tiles, it just varies up how many pieces each player has left if a player is able to pass. Um, so I guess it's a neat idea, but for some reason it just it bugs me a little bit uh, when I play, um, just because it, a big part of the game is knowing what pieces are left to be played and kind of banking on them coming out. And this throws a little bit of a monkey wrench in the works. I guess it's fine for variety if you've played Medina a lot. But for m most people, I would say don't bother with the tea tiles. Um, also, a change which you can easily do with the first edition is that I think the first and second players in second edition only have one action. And starting with, I think, the third player, they have two actions. Um, this one instead, everybody has two actions. It just says the youngest player goes first. That's their way of balancing it in a family setting. Um, easily enough to do in this one. I recommend that. This one also comes with a smaller board for two players. So the back of the board has a, a slightly smaller play area so you can play with two players. I mean, it's better having it than not having it. I would personally not really consider playing this with two players if you do most of your gaming two player i would probably skip medina altogether four is best three is not quite as good but it's 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 just a little bit different because you introduce a dummy color that all players have uh, pieces of and so they can kind of claim palaces on behalf of the dummy player. Let's say you already have a gray palace and somebody else is building a really gray palace, a, a big one. You know, you can claim that for the dummy player so that so another player doesn't get that. It's neat. It works. I don't like it quite as much as a four player game, but it works fine. It's just a little bit of, of a different experience. That's all. This edition's pieces are a little bit bigger um, and they're a little bit more shaped the merchants actually are smaller in the second edition but they're shaped like more like people uh, the walls look better in this edition uh, so the, most of the pieces are bigger i suppose technically second edition is the better one um, and is probably the easier one to find because this one is quite quite old now 2000 over 20 years old this game came out Whew. in conclusion medina is a very very special game very few games are similar to it. The fact that you start off from a very, very slightly randomized position and everything's up to the players, but yet the development of the board over the course of the game is very organic. And in the end, you have this almost work of art <laughs> by the end that you can all admire. It's a beautiful game. Um, it's thinky, but approachable. But the fact that it's an abstract game with very little randomness uh, is probably going to turn it off for some people. But I think it's an amazing game. No other game quite like it. Very happy to have Medina in my collection. Thanks for watching. If you like the video, please like and subscribe if you don't mind. Anyway, older games like Medina don't stop being good just because newer games come out. Take care.